クレイグ・フラン・クレイグフランクリンさんの発表を始めます。タイトルは、マシン・ラーニング・アウトサイド・ザ・カグル・ライン e です。Now we are going to start Craig Franklin,、uh, his, Craig Franklin's presentation. This title is Machine Learning Outside the Cargo Line. The presentation time is 30 minutes, including questions and answers. Before the presentation, the speaker will read the paper for the microphone test. Craig, please read out. Yep. Hi, my name is Craig Franklin. Uh, the title of my presentation is Machine Learning Outside the Kaggle Lines. My presentation will be in English. The presentation materials are in English. I will publish the presentation materials. I agree to have my picture taken during the presentation, and I will comply with the PyCon JP Code of Conduct. Thank you very much. Okay, so Craig, Mr. Craig, please share your screen. Yep. Okay,、right. thank you very much. Please welcome Mr. Craig with Proud. All right, thank you.、Um, so, as I said, my name is Craig Franklin. I'm here to talk about machine learning outside the Kaggle lines. To start, a little bit about me I'm a back end developer at a site called Vino Mofo, where we sell wine in Australia, Singapore, and New Zealand. And importantly for this talk, I am a recent convert to Aussie Rules football fandom.、Um, and The reason for that being that the project that's the inspiration for this talk is a machine learning application that predicts the results of Australian rules football matches.、Uh, if any of the topics I talk about here are of interest to you, you can、uh, look further.、Uh, the code is available on GitHub, both for the project at t a p r e s i u s You can check out my own. Uh, code examples,、uh, also my site, or you can follow me on Twitter、uh, at English Craig. So, to start, I just wanted to open with Kaggle is fine. I've actually learned a lot from their various resources.、Uh, the community is great, and Kaggle is very good. At what they do. So, for those who don't know,、uh, they became really popular through running machine learning competitions. And the way they do this is they give everyone the same objective and the same data sets, and then they ask you to create the best possible machine learning models for those objectives using that data. It's really good for competitions. It creates a level playing field so that really you can just focus on creating the best model that you possibly can, competing against other people, other teams, and, and it is fun. But, like, one thing that it doesn't really teach you is just all of the kind of problems and challenges that come with doing your own side project out in the wild.、Uh, when you're in charge of Kind of getting all your own data and really solving your own problems, it's a very different experience and a very different project. So, as I said, the project I'm going to be talking about was for predicting Australian rules football results. Now, the big question for those of you who aren't from Australia like, what is footy and what is footy tipping? So, footy is Kind of the term that Australians often use to refer to their version of football. It's a contact sport, kind of similar to American football or rugby, if you're familiar with those. And there's kind of this common activity called footy tipping, where you get a lot of people, especially in an office, you get co workers coming together and they have a, an informal competition to see who can predict the most Australian Football League matches correctly. Uh, so, this league is often called the AFL. And at the end of the season, the co worker who predicts the most matches correctly wins the competition. And I'm 
originally from the United States. So this was kind of a new practice to me and it was really interesting. And I thought it might be fun to participate, but since I really didn't know anything about Aussie rules football, I was like, I, I can do this in the nerdiest way possible by instead of using knowledge of the sport, creating a machine learning model to make the predictions for me. And I thought it would just be really funny if I could use that knowledge to then win my office footy tipping competition. Now, while working on this, like I said, you know, it's a very different experience from the projects you create from like books or for Kaggle competitions. So I made a lot of mistakes, uh, but I did learn from them and I'm hoping to impart some of that knowledge here in this talk. So one of the first things you really have to figure out is to clearly define your problem. What is it that you're trying to solve? What is your goal? So my goal was to win my office footy tipping competition, which meant picking the most winners of AFL matches. It seemed simple enough. It's kind of a simple accuracy problem. And so I went out, I collected data about historical AFL matches. I created a model, I trained it, I even built an app to serve my model's predictions. And as I was heading into the, my very first season of footy tipping, I was all ready to go. I logged into the website to submit my predictions, but I ran into an unexpected input. See, the problem was there was this form for picking winners and losers, which was fine. But as you can see there, they're also asking me what I thought the margin of victory would be for the matches I was predicting. And this was totally unexpected for me. And I didn't really know what to do. Uh, I had only created a, a classifier model. So I was only picking whom I thought would win. And I had no way of calculating a predicted margin of victory. So I kind of had to do the best I could, kind of look at other websites and just kind of copy paste uh, margins from other sources. And I learned from this, I, like I talked to some of my coworkers and I went to them and like realized that not only did I have to pick winners of matches, but the margin of victory served as kind of a secondary objective. So this was a case where I just didn't do enough research to really understand how the competition worked. So in my second season, I came back, I used a, a regressor this time so I could predict margins and I had no problem with submitting my predictions the second time around. Another important thing is kind of in terms of doing your background research is you really have to know the entire life stories of your data sources. In the case of Kaggle competitions, they provide all the data for you. Uh, you don't have to go looking for it. And what's more, they even have rules against using outside data sources. But when you're in charge of your own project, you not only have to find your data source, but you have to figure out a way to get that data into your model. And it's even more difficult if you're dealing with dynamic data sources, as I often do, because during the course of a, a footy season, you know, obviously matches are being played uh, and I'm constantly having to update data with the most recently played matches. So again, going into my first season of footy tipping, uh, I was all ready to go, I had my model ready, and I went to collect the data for that first round of matches. And unfortunately, something broke, like it just, I was missing some data. And when I looked into it a bit more, it turned out that one of my data sets was completely blank. And I just panicked because it was a really important data set for my model. And if I tried to do predictions without it, my predictions just wouldn't be nearly as good. So I had to kind of go back, quickly build a web scraper to, to collect the data from a different source, uh, and finally was able to submit my predictions. And what this taught me was, as you can see here, I have a, a few different data sources that I'm working with, different websites, and they all have different schedules. See, I assumed that all the data would always be available uh, with a few days advance warning before all the matches, but it turns out that's just not the case. Uh, as you can see here, some of them 
really only update the with the latest data the day before a match even. So you really have to react quickly as the data changes. And this is really important because you really want to avoid trying to make predictions when your data is missing. Uh, this is often like one of those things that can pass through your data pipelines and into your models without you really noticing. Maybe it doesn't raise an error. And that means you won't even notice that your predictions are worse than they should be. So just as you kind of want to check your data, kind of visually examine it on occasion to make sure it all looks good, you also really want to examine your data sources to know how they work. And all of this kind of leads me into the importance of getting by with a little help from your friends. Collecting and cleaning all this data is a lot of work. Uh, you often have to build web scrapers or maybe try to collect data from some hidden undocumented APIs. And all of this is really difficult to maintain. When I started this project, um, I was arrogant enough to think that I was just so clever and original that Obviously, no one had ever thought to do footy tipping with machine learning models before, but it turns out that I was very wrong. There actually is a whole community of Australian sports fans and statisticians who kind of combine their love of data and statistics and sport, um, and they end up producing a lot of great material. There's blogs, there's online competitions that are specific for statistical models. Uh, a lot of great people on Twitter that I've followed, and I've learned a lot from all of them. So in kind of relying on the community a little bit, I've definitely greatly improved the quality of my models. Uh, one really important resource that I've come across uh, in my later seasons of footy tipping is a package called Fitzroy. Now, this is an R package. So there's a bit of a challenge of incorporating that into my Python data pipeline and application, but it can really be worth it in the long term. So even though it's a little bit difficult to integrate, the maintenance costs of relying on a package rather than trying to maintain your own web scrapers, uh, it can really help you out in terms of reducing the the burden of maintaining your application because periodically these websites, especially if you're doing web scraping, will change their interface or completely rebuild it as uh, the official AFL website did just earlier this season. And it was one of my last remaining web scrapers and I had to completely rewrite it to use Selenium because the AFL decided to redo their website in a very JavaScript heavy way. So one really important thing for kind of the maintenance of your, your application and in particular your data pipeline is making your assumptions explicit. Uh, it's really important to think hard about what values can be missing from your data, what values can't be missing, what values must be unique. Um, when I started out, I kind of you know took a quick look at the data and decided to index my data by what I thought was the unique combination of team name, year, and round number. So you'd think that each team can only play one match per round per year. And for the most part, this is true. But as I started to build my data pipeline, I kept running into problems because it turns out it is not true for all seasons of the AFL. Uh, one particularly interesting example was the 2010 Grand Final. Uh, this just amazed me as an American sports fan because what happened in 2010 is they played their championship match and it ended in a tie, uh, even score. And because they had no rules for breaking that tie, they just decided to replay their championship match. Like I just could not believe this. And unfortunately that violated my assumption because here you had the same two teams playing each other twice, but it's still technically the same year and the same round. So it's these little assumptions that you really have to be careful and really have to examine. Because these sorts of data bugs 
really could be hiding anywhere in your pipeline. Uh, they're often silent. As I mentioned, like a lot of times, these sorts of things can get all the way through your data pipeline into your model, which generates predictions based on bad data. Um, you can try to do some spot checks, kind of manually examine your data uh, to try to catch them, but this is a very time consuming process. So what I found is really helpful for this is just raising errors in your code, making assertions that will stop your data pipeline if your data is uh, somehow wrong. So I'll give you a couple quick examples of ones that have really helped me out personally in this project. So one is when doing daytime sensitive calculations, definitely make sure that your rows are in the correct order. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm indexing on uh, team name season and round number. So not by date time because you can have multiple matches on the same date. Well, the problem is when I sort by index, that means my data rows are not in daytime order, which normally is fine. But whenever I try to do uh, say calculations of cumulative mean, cumulative sum, or even worse, when I try to use time series models, my data is not in the correct order. I literally spent an entire weekend trying to understand why my time series model was only getting 50% accuracy when I was trying to train it. And I was like, surely this model can't be as bad as just a random coin flip. Well, it turned out that my data was sorted by index, not by date time. As soon as I sorted it by date time, it was completely fine. My accuracy was back up to about 70%. So I added this assertion before every time I try to use a time series model or calculate a cumulative value. Uh, another issue that I often run into is, as I mentioned, I have multiple data sets that I'm trying to bring together. And in addition to just joining different data sets and the challenges that come with that, uh, my data sets have very different lengths. As you can see here, I have batch data going all the way back to 1897. So that's the largest one I have. But there are also some others, like when I'm using player data, most of that only goes back to 1965, you know, significantly shorter. And I also use a lot of betting data in my models. And that only goes back to 2010. So as you can see, like a whole 113 years of blank data. Now there's various strategies for dealing with blank values. Uh, I kind of consider trying to impute values, you know, use maybe a mean or a mode. But when I examined it, it just really didn't make a lot of sense for my data sets because, you know, what would it mean to have, say, an average uh, betting odds like win probability? It just didn't quite make conceptual sense. And I didn't want to drop all this data because then I'd be dropping a lot of useful values as well. So I, I settled on just uh, filling the blank values with zeros, settling for a slightly sparser data set, especially in those early years. Unfortunately, this had to, uh, tended to kind of create a lot of bugs. So whenever my kind of joins either were like missing some data or maybe a, the join indices weren't quite matching, uh, I would often end up with blank values for data that should not be blank. And this would often raise errors kind of later down the data pipeline, but it's really important to assert or raise these errors as early as possible, because that makes debugging a lot easier. You're a lot closer to the source of your problem. So, Whenever I join data sets and then fill those blank values with zeros, I will usually add some sort of assertion like this to make sure there aren't any dodgy zeros. And this kind of goes back to really knowing uh, the nature of your data. So in my case, I know that team name, year, and round number should never be blank and should never be zero. So I know if any of those values are zero, there's a problem somewhere and I need to go in and fix it. 
And uh, I, this is like, in particular, this one comes up a whole lot and has saved me so many times and really does a good job of illustrating the importance of making these assertions as much as possible because the alternative would be risking, again, making predictions with bad data, which really only results in bad predictions. Another important thing is you really want to optimize for maintainability first and accuracy second. And this gets at a really important difference between Kaggle competitions and long-term side projects. So with Kaggle, it's always very temporary, right? The competition has an end date. You do the best you can to create the most accurate or the model with the lowest loss. And then as soon as the competition is over, you probably never look at that code again. You don't have to try to refactor anything. There's really no concept of tech debt. But if you're doing a side project, presumably you want to be able to do it for a long time. You know, there are throwaway projects, sure. But like, at least in my case, I wanted to do this season after season, which means you really have to focus on making your code and your model as maintainable as possible because you really want it to be fun. Like you do these side projects because they're interesting, they're enjoyable. And if they become like a chore, if they become unpleasant, then you're just gonna abandon them. And that's really not the idea, right? So with that in mind, you kind of really have to consider the cost and the benefit of additional complexity in both your model and your application. In Kaggle, it's all about performance. You know, any sort of additional complexity to maybe squeeze a little bit better performance out of your model is worth it because again, you don't have any long-term costs. But with a project, you really have to be careful about what sort of long-term maintenance is going to be required. Um, if increasing complexity really improves performance, then you know obviously it's worth it. But as we all know, you eventually get to a point of diminishing returns. And sometimes you have to increase complexity a lot to only improve performance by a little. And again, then you start making this a chore to work with. And this really should just be fun. Uh, in my case, you know, my mistake was first season, I didn't really know a lot about writing good maintainable code. So I just kind of made the model this big complicated ensemble and it worked, you know, it got predictions out. But when it came time to sort of refactor code and improve my model for a second season, it was just too complicated to work with. And I ended up abandoning it and creating a brand new model from scratch, which, you know, it was a lot of extra work. Thankfully for my third season, I did a good enough job this time that I was able to reuse it and improve my existing model. So now we come to the joy of production. So you've developed your model, you've built your application, you have all your data, you've maybe been running things on kind of a local environment, your laptop, your desktop computer, but you really want to deploy it to the cloud. So you know, you and any of your friends have access to it from anywhere. So one thing about transitioning from a local environment to a cloud environment is you really have to know your system level dependencies or control them. Uh, in my case, you know, I developed my model and my application on my laptop. I deployed it to Heroku because I had experience with that. It's pretty simple. Unfortunately, my application crashed the first time I tried to run it because I didn't have any of the low level C libraries that my model depended on, in particular one called boost.python. So I ended up having to go back, re-architect the whole thing, put it in Docker container and deploy that. So this is kind of the sort of thing where if you don't have a lot of experience deploying to the cloud, it's easy to forget. Uh, you have to be really careful about these sorts of dependencies that exist on your local machine um, and, and think about, are they also available in your cloud environment or do you need to run things in uh, Docker? Another one, which is an ongoing issue for me is kind of you really have to know your server specs. So in addition to these dependencies that you might have on your computer that you don't have access to in the cloud, you also have to consider things like memory usage. 
Uh, my second season, again, I tried to run my application on Heroku. It had worked fine for a full season of footy. But again, first time I tried to run it for the second season, it crashed. The reason was this time I had added a lot of new data sets, including player data, which is a much larger data set than what I had been working with before. And unfortunately, player data used a lot of memory when I tried to load it. And my laptop had enough to run it OK, but Heroku did not. So I had to, again, go back, re-architect it. I had to deploy on DigitalOcean instead, use a larger server than I would have liked. And this was just because I wasn't keeping track of how much memory I was using when I was developing my model and trying to train it. Uh, and for any of you that have kind of worked with these technologies and these tools before, I mean, surely you know how memory hungry data pipelines and machine learning models can be. So you really have to read up on what the servers have available that you're deploying to. And every time you change what data sets you're working with, again, you have to look at how much memory each new data set uses and just make sure that your servers can handle that extra workload. So after all of this, after all these mistakes, these improvements, uh, you know, the question comes down to performance. Like how, how good was I at predicting the balance of an oblong ball? And I'm happy to report 2018, my first season, um, my model, which I named Tipresius, actually won my office footy tipping competition, uh, which felt great. Like it came down to the very final match and I was able to win by one point. Uh, and importantly for me personally, I was able to run equal with the odds makers. So like, you know, bidding websites put a lot of resources into trying to predict matches and try to be as accurate as possible. And to create a model that's basically as good as they are uh, was kind of really uh, important to me. So I thought after this kind of good start that, you know, I'd keep improving the model and surely I'd just be winning competition season after season and I would just be unbeatable. Fortunately, <laughs> that's not always how life works. Um, you know, even after all the improvements I made, after all the, the learning from my mistakes, uh, second season 2019 came around and it just, I started off not doing so great and just never got better. As you can see here, I lost a, my top coworker by five whole points and also ran in behind the odds makers, which was really disappointing for me. And I think the big takeaway here is again, like the big difference between a Kaggle competition trying to predict things in the real world is with Kaggle, they have their secret test data set and you're always testing your performance against that, which means you have sort of this static unchanging test that you're working against. So every improvement you make, you know, it's always being compared to the same thing. Whereas in the real world, it's, it's very chaotic. Like if you consider sport, like you think of the combination of the teams and their players and even just each individual play in a match, there are so many variables that this is just a completely unique event in the history of the world that has never happened before and will never happen again. And just predicting that is just really, really hard. And sometimes, you know, you can improve your model, but at the end of the day, it's, it's all about probability, right? And when you're dealing with such a chaotic world, you know, sometimes your coworkers just gut feel is better at predicting matches than your carefully tuned machine learning model. Thank you you for, for listening. Um, again, if you're interested in this and you kind of want to see more about it, uh, I serve my, my predictions for my model at tiparesius.net. Uh, you can check it out on, on GitHub or I blog about it sometimes on my site or you can follow me on Twitter. Thank you very much, Mr. Gray. Uh, there are two minutes left, so somebody Having question, please raise your hands or type the type the question on the chat room. Chat room. Anyone? Anyone? Anyone having question? Well, I'll just uh, in practicing this, I, I kind of received some 
some questions about dealing with the, the data sets of different sizes. And some people were wondering about kind of changes in, in accuracy with the longer data sets that are sparse versus shorter data sets that are a bit more dense. Um, and one thing I've kind of noticed is running experiments on data sets of different sizes I actually found that cutting off the data set in 1965, where I mentioned when the player data starts, uh, actually gave me better performance. So it's kind of one thing that I found interesting was having the really sparse data set with the most possible data doesn't actually lead to the best performance. Hmm. And, oh, somebody having question. I'm assuming you used to. Yeah, so I used Arvest um, to help with my own scraping. And that package I mentioned, Fitzroy, also makes a lot of use of Arvest. Um, I've also, like I said, for when that one site changed to a very JavaScript heavy version, I uh, used R Selenium for some scraping. Um, and currently, I, I initially used RPy2 to incorporate R code into my Python application, but I have since broken up the R code from the Python application into separate services. So I just use kind of a, a RESTful API now to connect the two. Yeah, no worries. Um, I, I have used some Python scraping like Beautiful Soup. Um, since most of my data source stuff comes from that R package Fitzroy, I've mostly done R for my data collection so far. But um, yeah, like Python has really good tools for that as well. Like Scrapey is a good example. Thank you very much. And the uh, time is up. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. And uh, please give him a big, big proud and uh, a proud. Thanks all for listening. Thank you very much, Greg. And the uh, session session room five is over. So yeah, that's it's done. Thank you very much. All right. Bye all.